She's a plant-based cardiologist who practices in Southwest Florida. And she does many, many things besides being a cardiologist. She has a podcast. And that's all about plant-based living. She also does cooking classes, which can be seen online as well. She's also a triathlete who has done many Ironman competitions as well. She's a cookbook author. And that's all about plant-based lifestyle too. So you can see that she does so much and a lot more than we even are talking about now. So we're going to introduce her right now. We'd like to welcome you, Dr. Delaney. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So nice to have you here. So that was just like uh, so many things that I listed off and I'm sure that there's a lot more than you do. And when I think about just being a, a, a cardiologist and having a, a patient load and, and sometimes maybe even uh, doing rounds at a hospital, I would think that that would be quite a bit of work. And yet you do all the other things that I mentioned and you still are able to maintain a plant-based lifestyle. So for anybody out there that thinks that it's uh, too much trouble to do, obviously it's not because Dr. Delaney can do it. I think that with all the things that she has going on, I think that we all can uh, learn from that. So um, Dr. Delaney, how did you wind up with this plant-based lifestyle? How did you find out about it? I actually learned in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. I went in one day and one of the technicians was eating this giant salad in this big bowl. And she was this little bitty thing eating this, you know, family, well, this cooking bowl full of salad. And I was like, hmm, what are you doing? And she said, I'm vegan. And I didn't even know what it was, you know? And, uh, she, and so she recommended that I read a book called, um, a diet for a new America by John Robbins, who is the son of Baskin and Robbins. So I, read that book and I was convinced right then and there that I wanted to be vegan. And so I assumed that my whole family would want to be vegan as well, but they didn't really want to join me. I said, you know, have at it. So I, I kind of did it on my own for a while. Um, and it was a few years until I was listening to a podcast and I heard them talk about the movie Forks Over Knives and what Dr. Esselstyn um, resonated with me was that if you take the time to educate people on the why and show them how, then you can affect change better. And his original study, as you know, he took 25 people that were the sickest of the sick at Cleveland Clinic. They couldn't be bypassed or angioplasty anymore. And he put them on a whole food plant-based diet. And he and his wife actually had cooking classes and they called them and they did a really full, close follow-up. And they had some of the best success that's ever been done in cardiovascular medicine, and they had no events for the most part. So no heart attacks, which is almost unheard of in any statin study, blood pressure study, stent study, bypass study over a 25 year period. And these were people that were really, um, you know, on death's door, so to speak. And that resonated with me. I came from a, uh, a family of teachers, anybody that went to college in my family really became a teacher. And so uh, we started having nutrition classes in the office in the evening. And the first time, it was the first time in my practice. So this was um, about seven or eight years ago. All of a sudden people's blood pressure started going down. Their cholesterol started going down. We got people off of diabetic medicine. It was the first time in my whole career that I actually start taking people off of medications. And obviously it went from one class to two classes to three classes, and then we changed the in, entire practice. So it kind of snowballed, um, you know, I guess, you know, probably as you as well, once the light goes on, it never goes off. Yes, exactly. And, and obviously, you know, it's, it's nice to have a visit with the doctor that supports this lifestyle and can educate you, but you can't just do this all in an office visit to no. help. No, I, yeah, I, I tried that early on, you know, uh, I had my regular cardiology practice, which was uh, primarily a preventative practice. So I would get referred people for some sort of chest pain, cardiac condition. And, you know, I, again, once you know, it's hard to say, let's just do a heart catheterization and stent when, you know, there's this alternative. So I kind of push back my chair and start this you know, 30 minute diatribe on everything plant-based nutrition and try to get that through to people. And of course, people weren't coming to hear about that. They were coming to hear about what procedure I was going to do. And so I would end up, you know, talking as much as I could, a lot of times to deaf, ear, deaf ears, 
Uh, and I'd be exhausted at the end of the day because I would try to say that same talk over and over and over again, you know, and um, it, it finally, you know, it just, you, you had to get people ready for it. They had to want it. And so that's gradually with the nutrition classes, if people were interested, then they, you know, would come to another nutrition class. And um, the only, the only negative feedback I had from the classes is where they were over, they didn't have the support. So when they were done with their six or eight week class, then, you know, they would kind of fall by the wayside once they, they, you know, they weren't, they had no accountability. So um, that's when we decided to change the practice. Right. Well, I mean, now you are a cardi cardiologist. I mean, that is, that is your specialty, but it seems like you help patients with other uh, diseases and concerns as well. Is that right? Right. Um, you know, the risk factors for cardiovascular disease are diabetes, high blood pressure, high, high cholesterol, um, and many lifestyle diseases share cardiovascular disease risk factors as well. So people that have diabetes have increased risk of heart disease, but they also have risk of cancer. So it, you know, it, it got to the point where we were um, starting to see other people come in because they wanted to get off their medications. So it became, you know, we started to see autoimmune disease uh, patients, people with cancer, um, you know, as well as the diabetic people, hypertensives, high, high cholesterol and, and overweight. So they, you know, it all goes together. Uh, there's, you know, when people talk about aging, you know, the biggest risk factor aging is lifestyle diseases, right? If we eliminated lifestyle diseases, then we would, you know, have infectious diseases less, but we'd even have less risk from infectious disease if we didn't have the lifestyle diseases. So, you know, there's nothing in a, in a vacuum at all. It all kind of goes together. Right. So the people that come to you, are they um, like fa facing a, a life and death uh, situation or are they just uh, find out about you from the internet? I mean, where, where do you get usually get your patients? It, it, it's across the board. I mean, we've actually had calls from hospital beds. Um, I'm supposed to have a bypass. Uh, I don't want to. What can I do? I've had a stroke. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want this to happen again. What can I do? I don't want to take the medications, you know, what can I do? And then we've had people that are plant-based that just want somebody like you said, supportive of a plant-based lifestyle. Um, and then, you know, the podcast people, you know, follow me, um, because of, uh, being a avid, uh, endurance athlete. Sometimes I, you know, I track people there that, you know, there are people that have maybe had a heart attack, but they still want to do a marathon or they still want to do something. And so we get those people and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it, it's become a lot easier because the people that are seeking me out are the people that actually want to take charge of their health, as opposed to me dragging them down a road that they really don't want to. Right. And then you mentioned athletes because I actually had, um, Dr. Ruth Hydragon last night. Then uh -huh. she, for those of you that didn't get to see that, she uh, was in uh, Forks Over Knives and she uh, does, well, she's going to be 86 this month and she also is a triathlete and she's done Ironman um, and recovered from stage four invasive breast cancer. And she talked about how there were athletes that she competes with and, and competed putting it in the past tense because they're no longer with us and how from the outside they looked so healthy and they thought that since they were uh running and training that that would was the answer to their health and you're saying that you're finding that there are athletes that are contacting you and needing your help right uh you know i mean i always say you can't really outrun your genetics, you can outrun a bad diet. Um, certainly exercise is very important and plays a very important role, but it won't reverse disease alone. Uh, nutrition is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's paramount that you, you do the nutrition as well. And, and that's exactly right. I'm, I'm getting up into the older age groups myself. I'll be 59 this, this year. And when we look at some of the events we do, um, we're in the top age categories, you know, and I don't consider myself elderly yet, but there aren't people doing the distances that we're doing as many because they start to get ill and so things start to happen. You know, um, the funniest, uh, you know, thing was, I think I ran my first marathon in 1999 and the physicians in the doctor's lounge would always, you know, get on me. Oh, you know, I used to run 
that's going to kill your knees. My knees are shot, you know, and I, and I, if, when I go back to the hospital time, and I don't go that often because I don't have that many people in the hospital, but when I go back in, you know, everybody always says still running, still running. It's like, yes. And you know, they've come and gone and had their knee replacements and had whatever, and you know, and I, it's like, my knees don't hurt yet. You know, so <laughs> we're still going. Right. Right. It's definitely, definitely the lifestyle. So, um, so you do, you do treat people with other, um, issues. I know a lot of people talk to me about osteoporosis and, and I try to encourage them to, to, uh, seek out a plant-based, uh, lifestyle and maybe be guided with a physician. And, you know, they say, well, how can I do that if I don't have calcium? You know, how do, how do I avoid osteoporosis? And, and do you see anybody about that? Absolutely. People come all the time to me with a history or a diagnosis of osteoporosis and they're not plant-based. And so, you know, 96% of the world or especially in the United States are not plant-based yet. Osteoporosis is one of the leading diagnoses. If you go to Walgreens or CVS, there's shelves of calcium supplements, vitamin D supplements, you know, um, arthritis supplements. And of course there's all kinds of prescription medications for osteoporosis. The United States, Great Britain, and Denmark are the, the countries with the, the highest level of osteoporosis and the highest intake of dairy uh, and, and animal protein. So, you know, if if the standard American diet was was a prevention, and that's, you know, certainly there's cheese on everything, right? When you go out, it's hard if you're plant-based and if you ever tried to order anything, you always have to say, hold the cheese a million times. Yeah, and I order a salad and I forget. And they have cheese on the side, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, but cheese where you never thought there could be cheese, you know. And we even see that in the doctor's lounge, by the way, when they have the, um, you know, the eggs with the cheese on and all that. Just cheese is on everything. So if we eat so much cheese and we eat so much dairy, then why do we have osteoporosis? If that was the if that was the solution, um, and it turns out that the more animal protein that we eat, um, the more acidic we become, the more calcium we leach out of our bones and the more the higher risk of osteoporosis so eating plant-based is not a risk for osteoporosis eating a standard american diet is the biggest risk for osteoporosis and eating dairy is the biggest risk and to turn that around when people come you know we start with a plant-based diet of course and we start with weight bearing exercise and it's very interesting um some of the studies with weight bearing exercise it's not just you know people talk about well walking versus riding a bike well obviously walking it's going to be more weight bearing doing strength training is more weight bearing, but it's also how you stand, how you walk daily act chores of daily living, how your posture is really determines the weight bearing load and bone growth. So we actually work with people in the practice to change the posture, change their mobility so that they're actually getting um, all that they can out of their exercise program. Right. So yeah, weight bearing exercise, that's very important to, uh, to build the bones. You can, can you expand upon that a little bit for the people that are watching that may not well, understand why? Yeah, that's important? It, yeah, sure. If you, um, if you if watched, you know, I, I'm, I'm a huge people watcher. So whether I'm in Sam's or Publix, uh, don't go to the mall, the airport, you know, you see people standing and, uh, especially women we've, we've worn high heels, um, you know, most of our lives. And because of that, our weight, the heel is up and our weight is tilted forward. And so just to be able to stand on high heels, your weight is on the ball of your foot. And when the weight is on the ball of your foot, your, your whole body mass is actually a head. Your, you know, your head is a, a, um, in front of your spine. And so you're actually putting more weight on, the, on your feet and less on your spine and your pelvis where you should be standing. So when we take people out of the high heels, and if you look, at, there's actually studies that look at your DNA of your leg muscles. And if you look at the, the DNA of people that stand forward, they're, they're, they've actually selected for shorter muscles in the back of their leg, uh, in the calf region, and longer muscles in the front. So it's not about just taking your high heels off and stretching. It's a whole change in posture and shifting the weight back so that you're actually putting weight where it belongs back into the hips and the, and the pelvis where you can, where you can actually develop, um, you know, more bone when you're exercising. So if you're standing on your toes, when you're exercising, great, you're going to have good toe bones, but you're not going to have necessarily good pelvis and hip bones. Right. 
Wow, that's very interesting. And then when you talked about that, I thought about the 10 pound purse that a lot of women carry. <laughs> yeah, so you put a 10 pound purse, you know, you go to the side and, uh, you know, so, I mean, we've really, so we've really uh, put ourselves in a, you know, a, a bit of a bind with just our acts of daily living, um, you know, as well as our diet. Yeah. Another thing that I have people ask me about because you know I've I've learned that uh, I, I have diabetes type two diabetes I don't have it I have type two diabetes that runs in my family mm -hmm. and um, so I knew that you know I was I was probably headed that in that direction right before I discovered this lifestyle I would get shaky in between meals and and it, it wasn't pretty so. Uh, so fortunately, I, I I learned about the lifestyle, but there are other people that have type two diabetes, and and they're worried about the fruit. They're worried about you know the carbs. So maybe you might tell us something about that. I've never seen a fruitarian that had diabetes, for starters. So um, and I'll I'll even challenge people: um, just eat grapes all day, um, and check your blood sugars. <laughs> See what happens. Uh, because it's not the the fruit. The fruit um, is the the sugar absorption from eating whole fruit, not juice, but the whole fruit is slowed by the fiber and the other antioxidants in the fruit. It's one of the healthiest things that we could eat. We all have a sweet tooth. It's our main taste bud for a reason. You know, if something is sweet, it's unlikely to be poisonous or rotten. Um, so. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's a, it's a good, uh, taste bud to have to, to want something sweet. It's been ruined by, you know, processed foods and cakes and candies and things like that, because obviously, you know, a, uh, an Oreo is much sweeter than an apple. Um, so we get confused as far as what is sweet, but, um, you know, as far as fruit goes, it's, it's that's the mechanism of diabetes is uh, impaired absorption of glucose because fat is blocking the muscle cell as well as um, the liver cell. So the glucose can't get in. So when we take the fat out of the diet, the fat off the person, their diabetes goes away. That's very profound. I don't think that people would realize that if you had type 2 diabetes, that it could actually go away just by changing what you eat and especially eating grapes all day as an experiment to show <laughs> they work, you know, it, it works. You know, the, the other thing is I'll ask people, it's like, so what is a piece of cake? Is it a carb? Is it a protein? Is it a fat? You know, and everybody thinks that, you know, the, the reason why the Atkins diet, remember back with me way back, yes. Atkins diet, Sugar Busters, I believe was his first book. Um, they said, take white flour and, and sugar out of the diet. Well, what were they? So if you eliminate white flour and sugar, you're eliminating you're you're eliminating cakes and and pastries, correct? So you're eliminating fat with that as well. So a, you know a piece of cake is cholesterol from the eggs and saturated fat from the eggs and fat, and oil. Oil. Yeah. right? And it, they're also sugar and flour, but it's you know it's a combination. It's not just a carbohydrate. So you know that's why you know a, most diets work to get weight off of you. They don't necessarily reverse disease, but you can get weight off because when you eliminate those foods, then obviously, you know, weight comes off. And, but the problem is people can only do it for such a long period, you know, a period of time that they put themselves in dietary jail and then um, they come off. Right, exactly. <laughs> so now how about um, autoimmune disease? I know that's a very broad category. Mm -hmm. but, uh, do you ever see people have patients with the, those yeah. challenges? Yeah, yeah, because again, they 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 cross over. Um, one of the first autoimmune patients I had, I actually was seeing him because he had atrial fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia, and he also had uh, asthma, and he had um, psoriasis, which is an autoimmune disease, and he had rheumatoid arthritis, and he had high blood pressure, and he was overweight, and so we talked to him about uh, changing to a plant based diet, and the first time he came into the office, he said it's not working. Um, you know, I'm doing everything you say. I'm not eating any animal products. I'm not losing any weight. Nothing's getting any better. And it's like, well, let's, let's go over what you're actually eating. And he started to tell me about the, the big, um, cookie tray of vegetables that he put in the oven. And he showed me, you know, with demonstrating the olive oil bottle, how he just went back and forth and back and forth and put all this olive oil on these 
vegetables before he roasted it. And it's like, well, I think I found the problem. Um, we took the olive, we took the olive oil out of his diet and, um, you know, it came back in, he lost weight, his, his rheumatoid arthritis improved to the point where he could get on the ground and tile his floor, his psoriasis went away. So autoimmune disease, you know, or things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or Sjogren's or multiple sclerosis, um, where the body attacks itself. It's a abnormality of the immune system. And the control center of our immune system lays in our gut. You know, we, we used to think that, you know, it was all lymphoid tissue and the spleen, but really the control center is right there in our gut with our gut microbes. So what happens there really determines um, how, you know, what kind of immune response that we get. You know, if you come in contact with uh, bacteria, then your immune system is fired up and you, we send out cells to take and get rid of that bacteria and the, and the infection goes away. With autoimmune disease, for some reason, there is a protein that's really been absorbed by the colon that shouldn't have been. Um, or the, the junctions between the cells in our, in our intestines should be very, very tight. And we shouldn't be able to absorb whole proteins. We should only absorb amino acids after the proteins have been broken down. But occasionally, um, because of being inflamed, we lose in the microbes that we develop from eating poorly, we lose that protective glue, so to speak, over top of the cells in the colon and these large proteins can slip in. And when they do, um, the body sees them as a foreign protein and the immune system is triggered. And, you know, there's where genetics come in a little bit. You know, if that protein kind of looks like a protein that you're kind of predisposed to joint issues, then it may attack your joints. If it's the brain and the neuron, it may attack the, you know, the brain, whether it be multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, um, you know, this development of, of this inflammatory state and the oil, again, if you take olives and you take the fiber and the, and the antioxidants away and you're just left with a liquid, you can see how you can absorb that very quickly into the colon and it elicits this immune response. And, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I just had the one meal, you know, um, but you, if you think about it, you know, if you, if you send out the national guard, you know, from Florida to New York, they're not going to get back in one day. It's going to take a while. And that's kind of like the immune system. When you, when you fire it up, it just doesn't shut off, you know, three hours after you eat, it could be five, six, seven days long enough for somebody to eat something else, you know? So you had, you know, uh, a bunch of oil on your roasted vegetables, and then maybe you had some sort of snack with oil, then you had some dairy, you know, so it's a different agents that keep offending people that, that keep them, you know, inflamed, so to speak. Right. Yeah. That, uh, that's a, that's a very interesting way of explaining it because absolutely you, you, you know, people think that they can just uh, have, have a, have a fast food meal and then have a plant-based meal and it's just going to erase it. But that when you send an army out, your immune system, it just can't uh, stop its tracks. It's going to take a while before it, it uh, can re retreat. That's a very interesting way of putting it. So I know, um, especially in Southwest Florida and, and Florida in general, but all, all over people are more and more getting concerned about dementia. Mm -hmm. And I know that that, I, you know, in the late stages, probably not too much can be done. And it doesn't seem like, you know, the, today that even with all the advances that the doctors are, uh, you know, the, the traditional doctors are able to really do much about it. So what, what do we what do you have to say about that? Well, um, you're right. There's no medication that will reverse uh, dementia. And the risk factors for dementia, there's, there are obviously different kinds. Um, but we know that sugar, simple sugars are, are inf inflammatory to the brain and the connections between the neurons. Um, cholesterol actually is damaging uh, and fat are damaging within the brain cell. And of course, the blood flow to the brain can be inhibited just like the blood flow to the heart or the kidneys or anything. So vascular disease is another component to Alzheimer's. Um, you know, genetics always is, is brought up, you know, because if we can blame our genes, then we really don't have to take responsibility for our actions and we can blame our parents. And, um, but the, we, there's, a, there's a genetic test called APOE4 that you can get. 
And if you have one of those genes, then you have three times the risk of other people of getting uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. And if you have two of those genes and you have nine times the risk, but there was an inter interesting study done in Algeria that they looked at those people and, and they actually had a very high incidence of having both genes. So you would think that there'd be an awful lot of um, Alzheimer's and there, there was very little, much less than in the United States per, per population. And it was found that these people, you know, they had a really high fiber, predominantly plant-based diet. So your diet does in influence. We don't have to turn our bad genes on. Um, you know, and it's certainly if we do turn our genes on, we can turn them on much later in life. Uh, I like to think of, you know, we accumulate metabolic waste and the more waste you take in and you, and you keep accumulating, the earlier problems happen. Right. So the, soon, the sooner we can switch over to a plant-based lifestyle, the better for, for our uh, potential uh, lifelong brain health. And right. You know, what we eat, we have to deal with, you know, so, uh, you know, regardless of, of what we eat, you know, we have to uh, metabolize it and compartmentalize it. And, you know, people say, well, what about salmon? You know, um, I heard salmon has good fat and it, yeah, it does. It has omega-3 fatty acids. Those are good, but salmon also has saturated fat and it has cholesterol. It has PCBs, mercury, dioxin, so heavy metals that can be deposited into your brain. So, with that omega-3 load, you get this other, you get all this other garbage, you know, all this other packing that you don't necessarily need. If you were to get your omega-3s from kale, you're getting kale, fiber, a little carbohydrate, a little bit of protein, you know, much less waste to have to deal with and to uh, eliminate from your cells. So you can see over and over, and salmon was a pretty good example. Most people would, you know, say, put salmon in the very healthy category, but yet it has all this extra stuff that we don't need you know, change that to a, you know, a Big Mac or, a, you know, a big giant steak. And you have a lot more uh, metabolic waste that we have to deal with that are all inflammatory. Right. Yes. It, it, unfortunately, it is thought of as a health food. That was, that was part of my healthy standard American diet when I thought that I was eating uh, I think that a lot of people, you know, that disease, a lot of um, people say I eat a lot of blank. I ate a lot of fish. I had a lot of chicken. I ate a lot of this. And, and I was like, well, first of all, a lot of probably, you know, even, you know, that's not what we're going for. You know, a lot of in, in, the, in, in our country where, where, you know, most of our diseases are from too much, not too little. So there's very few lifestyle diseases that result or diseases in general result from not enough of, but for the most part, too much of. Right. So um, another uh, disease that I hear a lot about, and this is very broad because, um, and I'm, it, would, it would be cancer. You know, there's, there's a lot of the areas of the body that it, it can attack. And then there's different phases of cancer and how invasive it is. So, um, you know, it seems like this lifestyle is, is uh, favorable to uh, helping to prevent it. And maybe what about early stages of it? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, uh, unfortunately, um, the war on cancer was started by uh, Richard Nixon in the 70s, I believe is when he was president. Um, and we haven't really cured it, right? Um, yes. There are more cancers, we have more drugs, we spend more money on it, but we haven't certainly cured it or put it behind us. And it takes, uh, you know, about 15 billion cells to, to actually make a tumor the size of a dime. So by the time we can detect it, you know, the, the cancer, the tumor has grown out of control for the most part, even if it's tiny, um, that mechanism that has caused these cells to, to start to grow ha has really um, started to increase. And again, people go back to, well, I have, you know, a genetic disease, but it takes some stimulation. So even if you have the worst genes for cancer, you have to have something that turns on the gene. It just doesn't, you know, all of a sudden turn on. You have to have some protein or make some something, some environmental toxin or some some exposure to radiation or something to get these things turned on. And then it obviously needs to be fueled. A lot of people, um, you know, cancer, uh, when we do a PET scan, uh, which is looking for cancer with radioactive sugar, um, the cancer tumor will take up 
the, the that sugar and that's how we can kind of detect where some of the cancer has spread. And so people have kind of deduced, and if you looked at the metabolism of a cancer or a tumor, they don't handle sugar well and they handle a lot of it. So people say, well, it's driven by sugar, but sugar is not a grape and, and sugar is not, you know, a potato. Um, sh sugar being simple sugar, but it's it's more of a the cancer metabolism is such that it's just not processing. It's it, we're, our whole body takes up sugar. Our whole body wants to run on sugar. This this because it's abnormal. It's not doing it. Um, it's not metabolizing the sugar well, so it metabolizes a lot more. It has a lot more waste products. But so if we change our diet to a very high fiber, plant based diet loaded with antioxidants and phytonutrients. You know, a lot of foods have anti-cancer properties, whether it decreases blood flow into cancer so the cancer can't grow, um, whether it actually turns on mechanisms that cause the cancer to, to, to actually shrink. Um, it may even turn uh, some of the foods like turmeric, for instance, um, will act as an anti-inflammatory, will make the immune system attack the cancer. It Im improves our immune system. So the opposite of an autoimmune disease is basically cancer. Cancer is when the immune system doesn't see the tumor and it turns its head and the cancer can grow. Where autoimmune disease, the immune system is fired up and it attacks everything in sight. So we need to restore balance in the body and the best way to do that is, is through nutrition. And you know, clearly uh, that's a big role in turning around uh, cancer and preventing it is, is nutrition. And you know, sometimes they see studies and you know, I've had some argument with oncologists and it's like, well, you know, this, this particular great chemotherapeutic agent, you know, has been shown to extend disease-free survival for three or six months. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, I'll put kale up against that any day of the month, you know I mean? So if all I have to do is do something for three months and not make you sick and not make, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, we, we take the nutrition out of, you know, it's, it, it, it could play a, a huge role. And, you know, so whether somebody is going undergoing traditional therapy uh, for cancer or they're trying to prevent it, certainly a plant-based lifestyle is not going to hurt anyone and it's going to just help. Right. And like you said, I mean, it's it seems like everybody has some kind of small amount of cancer cells floating around in their body somewhere. And mm -hmm. I mean, our, our body, we're having, we have cells that go awry uh, and we have DNA damage all the time and our, and our body repairs them. Um, but again, when our immune system becomes, as we age, we lose, our, we lose white blood cells, we lose our immune function starts to decline. So we're not as astute, you know, just like you, you know, you may not be a, as aware as you get older and when you're driving down the street, you know, of all the cars or different people, um, your immune system is not as aware either when you get older. So well, we have, these are right. So we, yes. So we have to have things to help us, you know, help us out, help our immune system out. Right. So it sounds like if somebody would incorporate uh, things like turmeric and kale, and that's not, that, that's not to say that there aren't other things that are in oh, the place yeah. that are good, but why not do it before uh, diagnosis? Right, you know, onions and leeks and the everything, onion family are, are huge, mushrooms, you know, and breast cancer are huge, um, you know, turmeric, cumin, you know, all of those, a lot of those spices, there's just on and on and on things that are very, very helpful uh, at either reversing or slowing uh, tumor growth down. Right. So um, now during this broadcast, when it, we have this now, we're in 20, early 2021, and maybe in the future, somebody might be watching and it may not apply or it may apply. Right now, we're uh, going through uh, trying to defend ourselves against uh, COVID-19. I'm imagining that in the future, there may be other viruses like that, or maybe even more virulent. So. I think it's on the, on everyone's mind. So I would be remiss if I didn't bring that up. What do you think about what, how people can uh, help protect themselves ag against getting it? And, and if they do get it, what would you recommend they do? And I know this, you're not going to give out medical advice to somebody that you have in counsel, but just in a general sense, what, what yeah. do you think? Um, so again, decreasing your risk factor, the number one, risk factor for a bad outcome with the disease COVID-19 
you know, when we talk about the virus, it's SARS-CoV-2, but when we talk about the Z disease, it's COVID-19. The number one risk factor for having a bad outcome, dying, going to the hospital, is being overweight. So we have to, you know, that's, uh, this is a call to, there's 75% of Americans are overweight. So this is a huge call out that we have to get our nation healthier. And, you know, that's, that's the number one place to start. Uh, we know people with high blood pressure, again, they all go together, these lifestyle diseases, um, you know, uh, people with asthma, uh, you know, other autoimmune diseases, again, their immune system either is not functioning or over functioning. Um, these are the people that we have to get these things under control and we can do them. Uh, again, diet and exercise, plant-based diet and exercise goes a long way to starting to, to get these under control, the risk. Um, but even, even with those, you know, without having any of those symptoms, you can still pick up a virus. Um, um, you know, so what do you, what do you do? Um, if you have a, you know, I, I don't believe that it is quite as contagious as, um, people think that it is. On the other hand, people don't realize they have the virus for a while. So, um, you know, there may be people in public places that you're, you know, you're socializing with or having dinner with or being working with that may actually be having symptoms, but you know, we're all, we've all gone to work with a headache. We've all gone to work with the sniffles. We've all gone to work with a sore throat. Um, you know, so the people do show up in public places that, you know, but again, you have to have some close contact with them for, for a while. So walking by somebody in publics, I don't believe is going to increase your risk. Uh, I don't certainly don't think people are going to get it outside. You know, I think that's the best place you could be outside fresh, you know, fresh air and sunlight. Um, you know, and the people you interact with, you know, you, you know, you be honest with, if you're, if you're a person that's at high risk, then you have to really pick who you interact with and the people that you know and trust that if they get the, you know, if they have some symptoms, they're going to isolate themselves. Um, that being said, you know, um, you know, full disclosure, I had COVID over Christmas and um, I was exposed uh, to, I had a prolonged exposure and did not know it, um, not in a hospital setting, in a personal setting. And, um, you know, I, I, I came down with all the symptoms. And so what do you do? You know, I mean, uh, I, I don't have any of the risk factors for, for bad disease. I felt, you know, I had a fever and chills and headache and back and muscle aches for a couple of days. But my plan of personal plan of action was to maximize my immunity and my anti and, and maximize my antioxidant intake. I believe that I was susceptible. I'm training for a 50 mile race here uh, in two weeks. And so I've been running 60 miles a week, Christmas, you know, I mean, I, I really do believe that I let myself get run down. Uh, and that's kind of what made me more susceptible that in a pretty heavy exposure, you know, the perfect storm, so to speak. But I took high dose vitamin D. Vitamin D improves your immune uh, function, it improves your T cell function. So uh, I took 25,000 uh, international units of that. I, um, you know, vitamin D levels is controversy. I'm sort of, certainly out in the sun running all the time, but I want to make sure my vitamin D levels were between 50 and 100. Um, vitamin C is the most potent antioxidant that we ingest. Our body doesn't make it. Um, we have to take it in. Animals make it. Uh, for instance, um, you know, a goat, when a goat gets sick, it makes 300 times the amount of vitamin C that it does on a regular basis. So when you think about increasing your vitamin C 300 times because you have an infection, it's really hard to do that with an orange. Um, you know, so a piece of citrus or tomato or bell peppers, they have, you know, 70, 90 milligrams of vitamin C. Um, we're trying to increase the antioxidants to 25 grams when to help fight infection. So that means taking in, you know, I, I took in liposomal, which is a coded vitamin C as much as I possibly could get in. Um, and I aimed for about 20, 25 grams. Zinc's another thing um, that's been shown along with uh, another antioxidant called quercetin. 
and quercetin and zinc decrease the binding of the virus, perhaps, or viruses, you know, not necessarily SARS-CoV-2, but it's been shown to decrease binding uh, of a virus. So I took high doses of both of those um, while I was sick. And, you know, I did, I did well. I was, I felt bad for, you know, like I said, three, four days and I started to get better. And by, you know, my eighth day, I, I stayed in nine, 10 days, and, you know, then, you know, was out around. I went back to work after 10 days, um, back to running, hoping I'm going to do that 50 miler in two weeks, you know, so I'm, I'm back to where I was. Um, I'm still taking vitamin C and D just to kind of give myself an extra boost because I, you know, know now that I was, you know, run down and I'm still doing what I was doing. So, you know, I'm doing that. I don't think any of that would hurt anybody. Um, that my only caution were if people were on a blood thinner called Coumadin or Warfarin, they should get their levels checked um, because some of those can interfere with the absorption perhaps. But there's no other drug um, or pharmaceutical that any of those would hurt. Uh, none of them are toxic. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. It's just my opinion. Um, you know, it's certainly you won't see it on TV as um, there's been some studies looking at, at people. So again, this is a benign antidotal um, treatment regimen that I, I put myself on that I've suggested other people do and they've, they've done well. Um, you know, so that, that was my, uh, you know, my plan of attack. Um, you know, we've had patients that, um, you know, have been older and got through, um, you know, COVID it's not a death sentence necessarily, but you need to be really proactive if somebody, you know, has asthma or symptoms that, you know, to, and, or autoimmune diseases to make sure that you're, you know, on top of that early that, you know, um, there's intravenous or I'm sorry, oral steroids, or there's in steroid inhalers, there's antibiotics that you can take that kind of lessen secondary infection. So, you know, you should see your doctor if you think you have, or you should call your doctor if you have those symptoms. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm going to tell you not to go into the doctor's office with a, you know, if you're ill without calling and expose everybody, but certainly call and get some information from your physician uh, on, on what you should do and keep in good contact. And certainly if you have shortness of breath, then you should go into the hospital. Right. So now you do telemedicine and I'm, and I'm thinking that you pretty much cover the globe with that. Yep. We've had people in several different countries and, um, you know, in practice around, uh, around the country. And, um, you know, we have a couple different levels of, uh, membership into the practice, um, you know, more of a coaching, uh, with a registered dietitian or, uh, with myself and the registered dietitian monthly or a full membership. And so when the full people have full membership, I pre prescribe and treat and advise and order test, uh, no matter where they are. Right. So all questions that I've been asking you, somebody who became a member could, could have your ear and, and talk to you about any one of those things one yeah. and get the advice. Absolutely. You know, a lot of people have, you know, doctors where they live, but then they use me as a second opinion and um, you know, that, that, that works out well. And, you know, we give people like, you know, people have my phone number, my email. Um, they have 24 seven access to me when uh, they're a full member. So uh, it makes it kind of handy when you can call and get somebody to answer the phone right away. Right. And then, yeah. Because of the registered dietitian on staff too, right? Absolutely. You know, and um, Addie, uh, who's my daughter as well, uh, as you know, she also uh, has a degree in exercise phys. So we, you know, we do part of our wellness and our movement and uh, things through that as well. So we want to keep people moving as well as eating, eating well. So it's a, uh, you know, it's a nice way to, um, you know, approach the preventive, preventative aspect of lifestyle disease. Yeah, absolutely. So for those uh, that are watching that maybe are already on this lifestyle and they do know the benefits and that's why they're doing it, other than the fact that you can eat as much as you want and it's delicious. Um, some of them are kind of concerned about, you know, you talked a little bit about vitamin D and C. What, what kind of blood tests should someone who um, has their uh, primary care physician that they see, you know, what, what kind of blood tests should they order? 
had them all. Yeah, because vitamin C varies day to day. You can't actually check a vitamin C level, but you can check, and you can't check a zinc level because again, it varies day to day. But you can check a vitamin D level because vitamin D is fat soluble and it's actually deposited into your fat. Um, uh, so um, you can have a vitamin D level checked. Um, you can get inflammatory markers checked. Um, so those are, are, are good. And of course, obviously your B12, if you're plant-based, that you should know what that level is. Um, you know, just because that B12 is not, you know, it's, it's why everybody throws plant-based under their bus, right? Because you you're, can get B12 from plants uh, because plants are bacteria and you have to eat uh, the dirt. They're, they're made by, you know, bacteria in the dirt. So you either eat dirt or you eat an animal or you take a B12 a few times a week. And if you're not, if you don't have this lifestyle, then you have to take uh, metformin. Uh. <laughs> and actually, a lot of people, because uh, most animals are raised on feedlots, they don't actually get access to B12 too. So a lot of animals are B12 deficient. So a, a lot of people take B12 because um, they're deficient and they do eat animals. So right, right. So what about like DHA, EPA? The, so looking at essential fats, and so the, those are, are what we call our omega-3 fatty acids uh, profile. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids go on to help make things like anti-clotting factors and anti-inflammatory factors and dopamine and serotonin. When you look at omega-6s, then they make things like clotting factors so you don't bleed, and they make... Um, uh, you know, inflammatory factors to fight off in infections. Measuring them again, it, it you know, it, it gives you a, you know, we, and some people will check them to see where they are um, with their nutrition. But the reality of it is you don't need much. You need 1% of your diet and omega threes. We want to lower the other fats. So by lowering the other fats, the ratio becomes better. And, um, you know, everything's okay. So I, I really don't measure much in the way of the omega-3s anymore. Okay, that's interesting. I think we might have some um, some some questions or comments in the in there. Let's just see if who's, oh, here we go. We have Carla. Hi, Carla, thank you for joining us. And this will also be on a podcast. So we're gonna read the questions out loud and Dr. Delaney can see them as well. And Carla wants to know, is meat required to build build muscle? My son says he has to eat meat to build muscle. <laughs> um, no, uh, horses have a lot of muscle and, and they don't eat meat, right? Um, you eat cows and uh, your hus your uh, son wants to eat a cow because it has muscle, but it uh, it doesn't eat it doesn't eat meat either. And if we put uh, your son in the corner and didn't let him exercise and just gave him steaks, he wouldn't have lots of muscles. He would. I hit my mute button. So I, I think, did you get the last, if you just sat in the corner and ate steak all day long, you would not be Arnold Schwarzenegger. You have to actually do the exercise to grow muscle. Um, if you eat meat, meat has growth factors that will allow you to put on muscle quicker. Um, but certainly there are a lot of bodybuilders that have, um, you know, eat, eat, you get, you get the same amino acids, the same proteins when you eat plant-based. And so you can get as big a muscle um, by exercising and eating plants is if you were to eat animal proteins. The thing that you get with animal protein is a thing called insulin-like growth factor and tumor necrosis factor that actually increase your risk of cancer, especially colon cancer. So, you know, you're better off building muscle and not getting cancer uh, than to have um, big giant muscles with uh, cancer. Right. And, and eating in the plant-based lifestyle, your recovery time is much faster when you're an athlete. Absolutely. You know, uh, hands down, um, you don't have the infl inflammation. So you recover from workouts so that you can train more. And by training more, you'll actually build more muscle. So, you know, it, it all it all works out. There are there are really no hacks. You know, the protein powders, a whey protein is a byproduct of the milk industry. Um, it has some growth factors in it because of, you know, milk is made to grow a calf into a, a bigger animal. You know, so those growth factors are there, but again, they also grow diabetes, they grow heart disease, they grow cancer, and you know, it's just not necessary. Right. Let's see. Oh, here we have Karen. Thank you for joining us, Karen. She says she's WFPB, which means whole food plant based, but can't seem to get my blood pressure down. Hmm. 
Um, typically we look at, um, you know, salt is a big thing that comes to mind first because, you know, a lot of sauces have salt in them. There's a lot of hidden foods. Um, what people don't realize is, you know, on the bottom of your screen here, you have a beet and tomato and Brussels sprouts. And if you just ate those things in fruit, you get about 700, 800 milligrams of sodium a day. So that means for the recommended 1500 milligrams of salt that the American Heart Association suggests, you only have 700, 800 more milligrams to, to play with. So a tablespoon of soy sauce is 650 milligrams of sodium. So there you have it. So you can get an excessive amount of salt really easy. And salt is not only causes retention of water, but it causes stiffening of the blood vessels. Sometimes people are eating perfectly and their blood pressure is still high. Then we look to things like the autonomic nervous system, how people are breathing, their sympathetic tone. Um, white coat hypertension is basically a hyper function of the sympathetic fight or flight hormones. And so by addressing some of those through meditation, breathing, uh, we can actually work to get people's blood pressure down. Right. Well, that's very, oh, let's see. We have another question from Ellen. Thanks for joining us, Ellen. I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad you're okay too. My question is, is it too much to have beans or lentils for one meal each day to get in the correct amount of protein? Also, does plant protein give you the same type of proteins that I eat chicken provides? What's the difference? Great question. So let's, let's do the calculation first. If I were to eat, you know, that if you go look on the back of a package, it says the standard American calorie count, 2000 calories in a day. We'll use it because it math is easy. So if I were to eat 2000 calories a day and I'm eating a whole food plant-based diet, which is about 10% protein, 10% of 2000 is 200. So 200 calories, carbohydrates uh, and protein have four grams or four calories per gram. So if you take that 200 and divide it by four, that is 50 grams of protein. So a 2000 calorie diet, no matter what it is, going to give you 50 grams of protein. And, um, that is, uh, you know, women 40, 45, men 50, 55, you know, the, the bigger you are, the more you eat. So by eating enough calories, you get enough protein. What's the difference between animal protein and plant protein? Uh, when they talk about their first thing is a complete protein and an incomplete protein. A complete protein has the exact same percentages of amino acids of the essential, non-essential amino acids that human muscle has. So if you look at a human muscle, the closest thing to a human muscle is an animal muscle. So the percentages of those nine amino acids are very similar. If you then look at kale, for an example, those nine essential amino acids are in kale, but they're not in it at the same percentage. So you're not getting every meal the same percentage as you would animal or human muscle. The kicker is that a lot of those amino acids, we don't want in excessive amounts the branch chain amino acids, like people get in supplements when they're, when they're doing bodybuilding and taking branch chain amino acids and leucine and isoleucine, methionine, um, sulfured amino acids actually increase the risk of cancer. So by eating a plant-based diet, you're getting lower amounts of some of those sulfured amino acids that decrease your risk. We know that animal proteins increase your risk of kidney disease. Plant proteins actually don't because again, you get the nine amino acids, so you get all you need, but you're not getting excessive amounts of the ones you don't want. Well, that, that goes along with the other question with the person that was looking at doing, using meat for their muscle building. It's very important. Okay, Carla, great question. Can a whole food plant-based diet cure AFib? That's a cardiologist question. Atrial fibrillation is the most common rhythm problems that cardiologists see. And that's my puppy in the background. She's just tired of being in the crate. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's You're just a real not, person. <laughs> she's, she's just not really happy about being in the crate this time of night. Um, but I, this, it's saving my shoes by having her in there right now. Um, the, uh, the atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that we, we, we treat. It's because of the heart gets stretched. Uh, and electrical circuits start to happen. So by, by eating a whole food plant-based diet, you decrease the stretching or the size of the heart. You decrease the blood, high blood pressure, which is a risk factor for atrial fibrillation. Uh, and you also treat, uh, in, decrease the risk of valvular heart disease, which is a risk for atrial fibrillation. But once you have that stretch and those abnormalities, then it becomes harder to turn back the time. It's like when you know the wire on your computer frays 
you know, it, it, it's hard to fix it. Um, you know, um, but by doing things, you know, we've had people that have intermittent atrial fibrillation. And so when they eat a high salt load and their hearts, you know, stretches because there's more volume, then they tend to have atrial fibrillation, fibrillation episodes. So if you're intermittent, then you could decrease the episodes, um, perhaps by changing your diet. But if you're in atrial fibrillation chronically, it won't make it go away. Okay. Well, oh, let's see. Someone is asking, what changes did you notice with your training when you went plant-based? I recover quicker. Um, I can do a marathon run the next day. Um, so it's just the inflammation in your body goes, goes, goes away. Um, like I said, I'm 59 years old. I don't have any aches or pains or joint issues. Um, you know, I get sore if I do too much, you know, if I do something stupid, I can, I, I'm, you know, I'm not bulletproof. I, you know, I pull, throw my back out. I've done all kinds of different injuries, but you, you just tend to heal. You heal quicker. Uh, energy's better. Um, uh, you burn fuel more quick, uh, efficiently. You know, you, you burn that glucose, your body wants to run on glucose. So when you're taking in good carbohydrates, your muscle store of carbohydrates are good. Um, so it, uh, you know, uh, People will look at me, you know, we, we, we go uh, to a race and we'll be eating a giant salad, kale salad, real high fiber diet before a race. And people get all worried. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I thought you weren't supposed to eat any fiber the week before a race or all this other kind of stuff. And it's like, no, you know, if you're used to eating that way, uh, your microbes are, are, you know, good about handling it. So, uh, you know, it works out good. Actually, yeah, I was going to ask you, what did you, what do you eat to fuel for a race? So is that typically what you eat? It depends on, it depends on what the race, I mean, I eat the same up to the day of the race that I always eat. I don't alter my diet, you know, before the race, I don't eat more, you know, I don't eat more pasta. I don't eat more bread. I eat the same, same, amount, same food and the same, you know, that I, that I would normally eat. Um, and actually I stop eating, you know, probably four o'clock the night before, you know, just to kind of get everything to go through. We're training for again, this 50 miler and we're actually practicing with eating sweet potatoes uh, you know, some rice balls and things along those lines, you know, as well as the traditional sugar products that people take in during, you know, a day that you, you divert blood flow away from your stomach when you're running. So you can't digest the whole meal for the most part, or most people can't, but things like sweet potato, white potatoes, you can actually digest if you slow the pace down a little bit. And so that we're going to do that because the race is going to take all day long. So, uh, some very portable foods, very portable foods. Yep. There you go. Okay, let's see. Deborah said, I hear apple cider vinegar, honey, and hot water like a tea. Do this daily. You lose weight. Is that all true? What's that about? Yeah, okay. no, I mean, you know, most of the time when people do apple cider vinegar and um, they become more health conscious and they give out something, you can't eat, you can't do what, you know, those, that tea and have a piece of chocolate cake and lose weight. That just doesn't happen. It doesn't do anything to change your metabolism or anything else. If you're taking in sugar, honey is a simple sugar, you know, you got to burn it off. So that's actually, that's a calorie. So I, you know, I, I don't see a reason to do honey, uh, you know, in a, in a tea or anything else. That's a simple sugar that's inflammatory for the most part. Right. So if someone was on this lifestyle and they thought that, that, that they still weren't losing weight, it's the, the honey and apple cider vinegar is not the reason why they're not losing the weight that they want to on this lifestyle. Well, yeah. I mean, apple cider vinegar doesn't have any calories, but honey does, you right. know, I mean, I, you know, I always look at people, if you, if you eat 10 extra calories a day, which is like a lifesaver. And, you know, so at the end of 365 days, you have 3,600 calories. Well, that's a pound. So just by overeating 10 calories a day, you can gain a pound a year you know, multiply that by a hundred, 140, that's a can of soda, you know? Uh, so a can of soda extra a day, that's 140. So now you, now you've gained 3.6, four pounds a year just by eating a, an extra can of soda a day. So I always tell people, look for the simple things, you know, look for what you cut out, look what, what you can cut out of your diet. That's not painful. You cut oil out of your diet, you don't taste it. So you, you're going to cut five, 600 calories out without having any pain. You cut the honey out, you're going to have another couple hundred out. So, I mean, without actually having to without actually having to portion control at all, you can start to lose weight. Right. So if, if somebody was a tea drinker, you wouldn't recommend honey. Is there a sweetener that they might be able to use? Um, you know, erythritol has been shown to be this, a sweetener that uh, is safe. But, you know, again, I, you know, I think that you, you know, I would 
look to flavors like, you know, maybe a little orange zest or lemon, you know, squeeze a little orange, squeeze a little lemon in your tea. Um, um, and just go with it like that. I, you know, I think when you, again, uh, uh, artificial sweeteners tend to make people crave sugar more and changes your gut microbes. So I, I tend to stay away from those. Yes, I agree. So VD, why my triglycerides are high and I eat only whole food plant-based, no processed food at all, no dry fruits. Um, I guess that's no oil, uh, no crackers, uh, no, no nuts in your bread. Um, so that's, that's where we kind of go through people's diet and sit down with them and try to find out where the problem is. Yeah. Cause there may be some other hidden things that they weren't aware of that uh, seem benign, but they're not. Yep. Absolutely. So let's just see if we have, um, oh, somebody's saying hi to your cat. <laughs> oh, and let's see. Oh, Leanne, thank you so much for talking to us. We can never get enough information. Leanne, I agree with you. When I first started this lifestyle back in 2012, I was really hungry for information and there really wasn't as much out there as there is today, which is one of the reasons why I started up my YouTube and Facebook and so forth. But that's how I found Dr. Delaney because I was so hungry for information. I was looking at podcasts and she popped up. And so I started listening and I just binge listened to, to her podcast. So if you want more of Dr. Delaney, you can listen to how many, about how many podcasts do you have now? Uh, I think we're 288 now. Wow. So, yeah, listen to the podcast. I'd like to get a million downloads. So let's let's try to get that. We're pretty close. Oh, and Jesse T says, great interview. Yes. I think that oh oh Lisa Lisa's saying that my skin is amazing. Well, whatever you put in is uh what, what comes out and uh and I even have I have orange hands, I'm very proud of. So the, it's not just the, the glow, it's also the coloring and all those uh, phytonutrients and all the different colors of the rainbow that I consume every day, they show through to my skin. So thank you. Let's see. Oh, okay. Well, I think we may have, yes, I think we got through, yes, we got through all the questions. Um, so, um, is there something else that you might want to tell us about that we didn't cover Dr. Delaney? I think we, we, we covered the gamut pretty good. Um, so I, you know, again, uh, people that have questions about the practice can email me at Jamie, J A M I at Dr. Delaney.com. Um, again, listen to the podcast, um, go over to Amazon, pick up a copy of the book. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, keep it simple. You know, get your food on the table, keep it looking like it came out of the ground as much as possible. Eat a, you know, a couple of nice big salads a day uh, with your other meals and uh, get out and move your body. Life will be good. Right. And I, uh, I picked up a copy of your book when you did a book signing. So it's a, it's a recipe book. And I don't know if you can, I'm going to try and see if we can show the picture of, can you tell us about the picture? Yes. Uh, so the little lady in the middle is the diva. It's my mother. She's 87 years young and she's plant-based. Uh, she uh, became plant-based after getting lymphoma. Um, she is the only surviving member of her family. Her mother died at uh, 57. Her dad died at 48. And her brothers died in their 60s of heart disease and diabetes. So I think that if you want to blame genetics, there's the exception to the rule. She changed her diet and kind of overcome those things. And uh, came up with a lot of the soup recipes in the in the cookbook. She's a she's a great uh, little Italian cook, and when she she just changed her home cooking recipes, there's shells, stuffed shells in there, hers, uh, and uh, came up with a bunch of the recipes. On the right is my daughter. She's a registered dietitian. Um, made me the uh, proud grandmother here recently. Uh, Kate, little Caleb is. Um, going to be a year old in May. And uh, so she's been, she was, did a plant-based pregnancy. We're, we're doing some podcasts on that. And uh, little Caleb is now starting to eat food and he's eating plant-based and loving it, growing healthy. Um, so I think it goes a long way to, uh, you know, three generations. And now we're, we're getting a fourth one that's uh, plant-based. Wow. That's wonderful. Well, this is a, this is an awesome uh, cookbook. It has 
I think almost, I think maybe a picture for almost every single recipe. It does. In the book, which is rare in cookbooks. And they're, they're very practical recipes. There are things that uh, even newbies, beginners can do. Uh, we're gonna put links to all the things that Dr. Delaney talked about, including her website and how to get in touch with her and her book and, and her podcasts. And just like in that in introduction, if you didn't see that, you're gonna have to rewatch this in the replay because I we did a little montage of some of the wonderful things that she does while she uh, has her plant-based practice and, and uh, lifestyle. I also wanted to thank you very much, Dr. Delaney, with all the things that you do. It is just so amazing that you uh, carved out a little time for, for us and the viewers. Uh, it, was, it was just absolutely uh, wonderful, very informative, very motivating uh, interview that you did. And, uh, and, and knowing that anybody can just reach out to you and ask you a question is, is phenomenal. Um, so it was very inspiring, very informative. Um, and I hope maybe you'll come back again because it just seems like the, the time just flew by and I'm sure that a lot of other people would have questions if you came back that we would want to address. And um, I also want to acknowledge someone that's been in the background all this time and that's uh, uh, Rebecca. She's there. She's with. She's from uh, PKA Solves, and she's been uh, doing all the audio and video. She she boosts my remote engagements. She uh, kicked me off of Zoom and told me about this platform, and and she's got a lot of knowledge, and she's been very uh, helpful to us. Oh, Mary says thank you, ladies. What a service for us. Thanks for for, for and uh, another somebody says, will Dr. Delaney be at the Punta Gorda Veg Fest? Well, Dr. I, I, yes, I, I will, and I'll be speaking. And she'll be speaking. That's great. Yeah, we're going to have a VegFest rep that's going to be coming on and, and promoting that as well. And uh, that's wonderful. And, and I want to encourage all of you guys, if you could please remember to, to like and share and uh, put comments in this. And the reason why is because there's the ways that YouTube and Facebook uh, put out information it's the more people that view, the higher up it goes in the priority. And it's so important to get this message out to people that this is a healthy lifestyle and there's so many um, diseases that aren't necessary to suffer from. If we could, and, and there are people out there that don't even know that this lifestyle exists and the benefits that, that it offers. So if we can uh, like and share and, and, and if you subscribe, you'll get to know other wonderful, I have more uh, physicians and other people coming up that you can ask questions from and, uh, and really learn about. So I really encourage you to do that. Until next time, be strong, be well, and be green. <laughs>